OK, I have one o'clock, so we're going to get the meeting started. My name is Kevin Mullen, chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. And the first item on the agenda for today's meeting is the executive director's report. Susan Barrett. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair Mullen. I have a few announcements and mostly around scheduling and some public comment announcements. Um, uh, as I've announced before, on August 14th, the uh, qualified health plan decisions will be released. Um, now we are headed into our hospital budget season. On July 31st, hospital budgets were due. Um, they will be uh, put up on our uh, website as they uh, come in. Uh, most of them are in. Um, and as our staff reviews them and peer reviews the information. So um, there, if you check out our hospital budget website, our webpage, um, you can access the narratives and the budget information. Um, I also wanted to just remind folks um, of the upcoming hospital budget hearings. Also on our hospital budget uh, webpage, there is a really beautiful calendar that Abigail put together that shows each day and um, each of the hospitals, the time that they're presenting, um, et cetera. These uh, hearings will be done by te through teams. We will not be in person. And just as a, a heads up, we have the hearings on August 18th, August 20th, August 24th, August 26th, and August 28th. If you have any questions, please reach out to me or Abigail. Um, we also have August, on um, August 14th, a Data Governance Council meeting. So Tom and I and the rest of the council members will be there. It is also open to the public. We'd encourage you to attend. Um, in terms of public comment, uh, Elena and the team will go through this during the sustainability uh, presentation, but we did receive two written public comments for the sustainability plans. And then uh, lastly, I wanted to uh, let uh, folks know that, uh, and many folks know this, that we at the board have been working towards re um, working on regulatory alignment. And to that end, uh, staff working with a couple of our board members um, have, has done an incredible job of putting out a draft, uh, actually several draft white papers on the Green Mountain Care Board regulatory alignment. Um, these white papers are now open um, and posted for public comment. We'll have a presentation by Sarah Kinsler, who was uh, the person who led this work um, at the end of September, but I'd really encourage uh, everyone to check out our website under public comment. And um, if you look under regulatory alignment, you'll see um, discussion drafts of part one and two of our regular of Green Mountain Care Board regulatory alignment. Also, Sarah Kinsler will be uh, sending out some emails and um, to interested parties uh, so that you'll have a copy of these in your email. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair, unless there are any uh, questions from the board. Thank you, Susan. Um, seeing no questions from the board, the next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, July 29th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. So moved. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, July 29th without any ad additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Abigail Connolly so that she can properly record all attendees of this meeting for the public record. Thank you, Kevin. I'm going to call out the last four digits of your phone number. If you could just state your name clearly, I will take attendance. I'm going to start with 2449. Kathy Fulton, VPQHC. Thank you. 4191. Devin Green, Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. Thank you. 6376. 
Mort Wasserman. Thank you. 6977. Jason Williams, the University of Vermont Health Network. Thank you. 5010. 5010. I'm going to move on to. Is that a copy number? number? So I just got back on the phone. That's Tom D. Southwestern Vermont Medical Center. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> uh, 1080. Maria Holt, Port of Medical Center. Thank you. 1905. 1905. Okay, um, 5817. Joseph Hoff-Garen from the Vermont Medical Society. Thank you. 3452. Rebecca Copan, Blue Cross Blue Shield. And I do have Ham Davis as well. Um, and there are other people that are listed, but their names show up because they're joining via Microsoft Teams. Thank you so much. Thank you, Abigail. So the next item on the agenda, um, we're going to turn this over to Sarah Lindberg and a whole bunch of other people to talk about geographic reporting. And Sarah, are, are you taking the lead or is one of your team members? Are you able to hear me? We are now, Hello? yes. Okay, great. Uh, good morning or afternoon, sorry. Uh, this is Sarah Lindbergh. I'm the, a health services researcher with the Green Mountain Care Board, and I'm delighted today to be providing you with an update from our uh, analytic team, the A-team. And uh, what we'll do is kind of step through different reports with different owners of that. And unlike a typical presentation, we would encourage you to interrupt with any questions along the way after each person's finished with their section. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kate O'Neill to start. Hi, hopefully you can hear me. You can see our presentation. We can hear uh, you. Great. So uh, I'm going to uh, kick us off with uh, just a, a brief summary and update of the Data Governance Council. So the Green Mountain Care Board's Data Governance Authority comes from uh, many sections of 18 BSA and uh, the board has broad authority uh, for maintaining a healthcare database, including hospital and insurer reported data. And um, to that end, we have stewardship over VCures, which is our eligibility and claims administrative data uh, for Vermont residents, as well as the um, VUDS data, the hospital discharge data for inpatient, outpatient, and emergency department services provided by Vermont hospitals. And that's for both Vermont residents and non-residents. Data governance covers a lot of concerns. And so the Green Mountain Care Board is responsible for um, what we've bucketed as these four sets of um, these categories, risk management, ensuring uh, data privacy and security standards and practices, data quality um, to ensure the highest possible quality of our data resources, program sustainability, and, uh, and data release, supporting clear processes for, um, for the release of data. Um, and the Green Mountain Care Board created a Data Governance Council with authority to make executive decisions and assign resources. And that council meets approximately every other month. Susan announced that the next meeting coming up is next Friday. Uh, it's currently composed of seven voting members. Um, and uh, currently, those members are two Green Mountain Care Board staff, one board member, and that's um, member Tom Pelham. We have two state agency representatives. One comes from DIVA, one comes from the Vermont Department of Health, and then two non-state entity representatives. DPQHC is on our council as well as by state primary care. 
Um, we have a number of resources on our website. Um, I just called out a couple here, but the, we have a charter and that was adopted in March of 2018. And we have um, a principles and policies document, which we uh, adopted in April of 2019. These are links, but um, but there, this and more is available on our Green Mountain Care Board website under our data and analytics section. Right now, the current issues for the Data Governance Council include um, a rule update. Right now, um, we have one rule and uh, that addresses data submission as well as data release. And we are in the process of drafting um, an update to that, which um, we would propose to split into two rules, uh, a data submission rule as well as a data release rule. And we have provided updates to the council um, over time in terms of um, our, our drafting of that and getting their input along the way. We have uh, some policy guidance that we are uh, nurturing at this uh, point in time, um, including data linkage, um, defining it for us, for the Green Mountain Care Board, and the conditions and the limitations under which uh, the linkage would be allowed. Um, and also structures for available data release based on intended use. And so we're always looking at that. Um, when we release our data based on intended use, we wanna make sure that, um, that it's, it's meeting with those concerns uh, that the, the council addresses. Uh, we also always um, watch and, um, and provide updates on healthcare data related activities at both the state and federal levels. And um, we bring uh, specific data release applications and data linkage requests before the Data Governance Council from time to time. And that's it for me. Uh, I am now going to hand it back over to Sarah. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, so. I'm just gonna tee off a set of reports that we'll be releasing shortly. Um, and to do that, I'm trying to do a better job of kind of reacquainting people to some of the concerns that we have when we do healthcare um, analyses in this area. So if you please advance to slide nine. So um, again, whenever we do an analysis, there's the, the place from which we start is, is this a resident-based analysis? Is it, is, are we talking about Vermonters based on where people live? Or are we talking about a provider-based analysis? And that's where the care is delivered. So from our recently released 2018 expenditure analysis conducted by the one and only Lori Perry, uh, our current estimates for the resident spend in 2018 was $6.3 billion. And an example of a resident-based analysis would be what we're doing when we measure the all-payer total cost of care. Um, on the other side of the coin, uh, there is a provider analysis associated with the expenditure analysis, and that estimated $6.4 billion in 2018. And something that the board does that is more of a provider look would be your hospital budget review, which may be on your mind um, <laughs> at this time of year. But uh, that would be based on where the care is delivered. So people come in from out of state, and it involves uh, Vermont residents as well. And so for people who like to think more in matrices, if you please advance to slide 10, you can see so on the left-hand side is um, you know, whether the person lives in Vermont or outside of Vermont. And on the top, we have um, where the care was delivered, either in Vermont or outside Vermont. So a residence-based analysis just goes across that row where Vermonters, whether that care was delivered in Vermont or outside Vermont, we are counting that care, and that's what happens for our all-payer model accountability. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, which is 11, you can see the inverse of that, the provider-based analysis. So the care is delivered in Vermont, whether that care should be delivered to someone who lives in Vermont or outside of Vermont. And again, that's um, more like the hospital budget process. And slide 12 goes on to show how different some of these measures can look compared to one another. So again, that um, spending on behalf of Vermont residents in 2018 system-wide was estimated to be $6.3 billion, but we only count $2.9 billion of that, or less than half in our total cost of care for the all-payer model. 
So important things like pharmaceutical spend and government-based activities are not included in that measure. So it might behave much differently than something on the system-wide spend. And again, just for um, comparison, for One Care Vermont in 2018, their actual um, total cost of care was only 10% of this whole Vermont expenditure analysis um, spending on behalf of Vermont residents, according to our estimates. So I think whenever we're um, trying to piece together different uh, reports or numbers, it's good to try to ground yourself in how this compares to the, the whole enchilada, if you will. And uh, we are not featuring it today, but we do have a visualization that's devoted to the um, expenditure analysis that is probably worth checking out if that's what's of interest to you. Um, and then slide 13 may be where I'm turning it over. I can't re quite recall. Oh, no, I'm going to tee up the reports first. Great. So um, we're going to be featuring four different interactive reports, which may be helpful to you, particularly as you start reviewing hospital budget submissions. Um, the first uh, is what we call patient origin, and that's based on our hospital discharge data. And that's um, that provider look. So given what's happened at our regulated hospitals, what has utilization looked like um, for all patients. Um, then we'll have a look at our patient migration analysis, which says, based on where people live, how are their dollars being distributed across HSA? So for everyone who lives in the Barry HSA, what proportion of those dollars are spent in Barry versus Burlington, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a second one we'll be walking through. Um, the third one is actually just a refresh of an existing report, and that's a very high level look at the all payer models total cost of care. So that's just looking at um, that all payer model metric of the total cost of care based on where people live and also membership. So we'll just give you a quick refresh of that report. And another report to remind you of that we'll wrap up with has to do with a longitudinal look at hospital budget submissions that we tried to put in an interactive report to make it a little more user friendly, especially for some of these big picture metrics. So um, I believe now with slide 14, I will turn it over to um, Jeff Batista. Thank you. Awesome. And before Jeff gets started, if I could just ask everyone who's not speaking to mute themselves. There was a little bit of feedback during Sarah's presentation, so um, if we could all just uh, make sure that we're on mute, um, we should be able to hear Jeff. Thank you. All right, thanks a bunch, Kevin. Um, so I will be talking about our patient origin dashboard, the first version, as Sarah has, um, and we'll move on to the next slide now, Kate, if we could. Um, so as Sarah mentioned, uh, this is a look at all of the Vermont hospitals and anyone who goes to them. It is a provider-focused analysis. Um, so we're looking at all of the hospitals that are subject to budget review. Grace Cottage has been included by this point, so you can ignore that little gray bit there. And for those who don't know, Grace Cottage is located roughly between Brattleboro and uh, Bennington up north a bit in the area I'm circling. Um, so. We're looking at all the hospitals subject to budget review. Patients or anyone who receives care at these hospitals, either inpatient or outpatient, or the hospital's associated practices, um, for example, uh, uh, an outpatient clinic for UVM or um, CVMC. And uh, this includes out-of-state residents as well. Um, we're excluding emergency department visits um, as these tend to take place closer to the, at the closest hospital um, not necessarily a choice decision of where you go seek to emergency care. Uh, next slide. So the data is derived from VUDS, which is the state's hospital discharge database. Uh, VUDS registers discharges by episode, which is essentially everything that precedes a discharge uh, from arrival to exit. Um, this includes the diagnosis, um, the uh, multiple diagnoses, the uh, and other sorts of variables along those ends. Um, the patient origin dashboard that I'm going to be showing will filter data according to certain characteristics that you see to the right. Um, these include all hospitals as broken down individually, the patient location as defined by the Vermont Hospital Service Area, as well as a recoded out of state uh, value, the locale, which could be inpatient, outpatient, or that outpatient expanded uh, metric that includes the clinics and places like that. The payers are broken down by Medicare, Medicaid, and a recoded commercial variable that includes Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and other commercial um, insurers. Um, of course, we have data for TRICARE, Workers' Comp, and other types of insurance, but as the numbers get smaller as you break it down, 
Uh, we want to protect the anonymity of people who may, uh, who could be identified by the particularities of where they sought care, um, if there aren't many other people seeking care the same way. Um, in that vein, we excluded any combinations of these variables that had fewer than 20 episodes attached. Uh, this means most self-pay and free, free care uh, was excluded as well, though I'd be happy to speak to those trends outside the dashboard itself. Uh, next slide. So I'm going to move on to the Tableau visual. I put in two images here for those looking at the PowerPoint, but I'm going to be assuming control and showing you how this works in real time. So can everyone see a map of Vermont in front of them? Yes, yes we can. Yes. Excellent. It takes a couple seconds to load there. Um, so here we have um, what the first visual looks like. It is a map of Vermont with an area graph of the episodes of care. Um, so you select the hospital, the locale, um, the payer, and you can move through time as well and see how those move. Um, uh, by market share and geographically. Um, so uh, let's see, as one moves down, um, the different types of care have different patterns. For example, inpatient care tends to be from the HSA of the hospital, unless it's a particularly large hospital. Um, outpatient care, you're seeing more people from different HSAs um, coming in. And um, we have this 10 mile buffer here to represent out of state patients. So what you're seeing here shaded is where the patients are from, and then you choose the hospital pairs, locales, and years over here. Uh, moving on to the second visual, um, this provides a better perspective of the payer mix by hospital episode. Um, so breaking it down here to all inpatient at Vermont hospitals, we see a general decline in the number of or inpatient episodes with um, the commercial rate taking up a larger share as time moves on, Medicare sort of shrinking as you move along. Now, there are plenty of caveats to consider when looking at these trends, um, and a lot of them involve not only hospital decisions, but broader uh, state policy, federal policy trends going on at the same time. If we can move on to the next slide, Kate, that has the discussion points, and I'll stop sharing right sure, here. Sure, and this is slide 19. Yep. So, um, Presentation has ended, someone else has started sharing. Excellent. So uh, this is the, I just wanna provide some context for how to read the hospital discharge data. So the dashboard shows the volume of episodes at Vermont hospitals, but it does not explain the trends. However, one can take the data and factor, and we're going to factor into our own staff research for regulatory decisions and other board concerns, such as the sustainability analysis as it moves forward or not, depending on the vote today. Um, and. But I'd like to note some factors when interpreting the trends. For one, there were many state cha changes to uh, federal and state programs, regulation, et cetera, between the time period that we have the data. Uh, for example, the ACA uh, began to take force many of its provisions. In addition, there were state efforts to redetermine Medicaid eligibility beginning in fall 2015, and that declines with an overall um, amount of episodes for Medicaid payers since then. Um, also, technological innovation could allow the same care to be delivered in an outpatient setting over time. Uh, we, medical technology is this moving, uh, uh, it moves along as we measure the data, so it's in, we can't really determine uh, whether people are not seeking inpatient care or whether that inpatient care has simply moved to a different context. Along with this, some of the smaller hospitals, you will see abrupt changes to episode volume. Um, this can be explained by a number of ways. You have to look into the budget documents and other complementary information, uh, but it could involve hospitals that spin off, spin off the operations into separate firms, hospitals that change the services they provide, doctors who retire and are not immediately replaced, as well as independent and new doctors who join hospitals. Uh, finally, um, when we're breaking it down to the spatial level of the HSA, the hospital service area, the changes to travel may in part signify population change in the HSAs, not necessarily anything uh, that's been going on in healthcare policy or the hospitals, or simply that the HSA is a poor indicator of the de facto hospital service area. And uh, that is something we can certainly look at uh, with VDH moving forward. So I will pass it on to uh, Lindsay for the patient migration analysis. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but before, uh, I'm sorry, Lindsay, before you take over, if there are any questions for Jeff before we move on. Uh, 
Hi, this is Mord Wasserman. I had one for Jeff. What what distortions, if any, are introduced to the hospital discharge database by the fact that it's an episode-based rather than a person-based database? Um, I could get back to you with a more specific response. I would say that um, I don't believe we have a person-based data. Or it would be VCURES, which is claims versus um, VUDS, which is episode, and both have trade-offs in the way that they consider the individual. Um, but I'd be happy to look into that further and get back to you or punt it to um, another member of the A team. Thanks. Yep. Okay, uh, Lindsay, I think you can take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, and thanks, Jeff, for introducing the patient origin part to this two-part project. Um, Kate, if you could advance the next slide. Yep, so, so we're on I, slide 21 now. Yep, thanks. So um, patient migration is really the second part to this joint project, um, which we are calling patient origin and migration. This project was approved by the GMCB in um, December 2019. The scope of patient migration is to help measure the total medical claim spending in VCURES that's mapped from the hospital service area of residents to the hospital service area of the rendering provider. Um, this is really a high level look at the movement of Vermont patients and the flow of expenditures with those patients in and out of their hospital service areas. Um, of note for hospital budgets, um, our team provided just the 2018 snapshot of patient migration. This was given um, in static tables for non-financial reporting. Um, and so what you're, what we'll go over in the next couple slides is the interactive version and expansion on that initial report. Um, slide 22, please. So before I get into um, the nuts and bolts of the Tableau visualization, I just wanted to show um, some of you are probably some, going to be some of our end users. So I wanted to show you all some of the back end data that's going into this report. Um, the of note, the data structure here is curated, um, will be curated from aggregating claims data. So any observations shown here are purely hypothetical, not based on any existing claims data, just to give you an idea of what the back end looks like. So we've taken patient ID, age range, gender, month and year of both their eligibility and their claims. It's important that those match up. The primary payer, HSA of residence, HSA of care, the number of claims, claim type, expenditures, and out-of-pocket spend. And we've aggregated all of that, um, and that is what is powering this visualization that we're about to go look into. And I'm gonna talk next on slide 23 about the data cleaning steps. Um, if you could advance, thanks. So the way that we curated these data, we require patients to be 18 or older with a Vermont zip code in the year. The Vermont zip code is what was used to associate the patients with their hospital service area. And I use BDH's hospital service area version four. The claims were claimed to include only those paid and paid by the primary payer. Say that 10 times fast. <laughs> claims are inclusive of all services and provider types. So we've got everything in there, not just inpatient and outpatient like we have in the BUDS data. Pharmacy claims, we do have those, but they're only for retail pharmacy purchases. And so what we're excluding in that are those um, pharma any pharmaceuticals administered during a medical visit. 
the data are limited to payers submitting to VCARES. So not included are the uninsured, federal employee insurance, workman's compensation plans, TRICARE, and approximately 50% of the self-funded market. Although we are getting some of that back. Um, and per request, we include um, some hospital service areas around the Albany Medical Center and the Dartmouth-Hitchcock um, Hospital. All other out-of-state visits and claims are summarized to other non-Vermont areas. So slide 24. Thank you. Um, I am, so I'm actually going to go through some static views of what is going to be in the interactive visualization. And just as a heads up, that's because I still have a little bit more work to do with scrubbing my data to make sure that it can be a publicly available use file. Um, and we didn't want to put anything in the presentation today that we couldn't immediately give out to people. So, um, so that's why we're going to look at some static versions of this, but in Tableau, this will all be able to be manipulated. So what we're looking at here is to the left, we have choices of year and hospital service area of residence. And toggling those two options will impact the three views you see. So the center view being medical spend for the residents of the hospital service area selected. So in this example, we've got, we're in 2019 for the Morrisville hospital service area residents. We're looking at the total medical spend for residents of Morrisville and the larger chunks are the hospital service areas of care where their money is spent. So the largest proportion of spend for Morrisville residents is in, um, for medical, is in the Morrisville hospital service area. Second to that is Burlington. That's how you would read this chart. Um, all the way to the right, we have an age and gender profile for the residents of Morrisville in 2019. These are not, um, these aren't radically different over time or by hospital service area, but I thought this was an important piece to include. Um, and then the bottom half of this first viz answers what proportion of total spend for Morrisville residents stays within Vermont and what proportion goes to providers outside of Vermont. And we've broken that down by payer. And you can see that, um, uh, a lot of Morrisville residents spend stays in state and actually relatively stable over time. Um, once you're able to go into this phys visualization yourself and play with the hospital service areas, you'll see that this is not necessarily the case depending on the hospital service area. So this is this first dashboard is for the hospital service area of residents. You can go to slide um, 25. Oh, you beat me there. So this next one is the interactive version of what was provided in the non-financial budget guidance. So the way that we read this is the hospital service area of residents are the rows, the hospital service area of care are the columns, and this is, you can slide back and forth to see the full list. And on the lower left, you can toggle between all these different options. So to select measures, you'll have the ability to select between the allowed amount, um, a patient count and claim count. You can select years, 2014 to 2019. You can select to look at a particular insurance and or you can select to look at a particular claim type. Um, so you can look at them one at a time or all together to get kind of a global view and you can see um, the flow of money through and outside of the state um, just in this kind of chart view. So that's what's in the second dashboard. And then on slide 26, this one is a little bit more specific to a payer breakdown. So here we have a, the medical spend by payer for the residents of, again, uh, Morrisville, and we're in 2019. So this is just showing 
similar to the very first dashboard, um, what those trends look like over time. The lower left, you can select between the year. This year and uh, this year button will also help help you change the out-of-pocket trends table. So you'll be able to see average and median out-of-pocket trends by payer and by claim type for those residents. Um, like for example, here you can see that um, Medicare and commercial are kind of on par and then Medicaid um, for average and median are, are lower. And then all the way to the right, we have a summary of the proportion of medical spend for Morrisville residents that's spent within their HSA versus outside of their HSA. So that's a little bit different than measuring how money flows in versus outside of the state. This is more looking at how money flows through the HSA itself. Um, so again, if you, on the interactive version, you'll be able to toggle the HSA of residents and the year to change that statement and the proportions. So next slide, 27. Um, so the next steps for phase one, which uh, phase one, version one, this interactive visualization and a HIPAA compliant public use data file will be available on our website soon for everyone to use, play with. Um, and for phase two, which is the 2021 report, we are thinking of incorporating a couple of things, um, patient level risk measures like the ACG risk score by HSA and payer and age. Um, also adding visit counts to expand on the current measure of claim count. Claim count is kind of a proxy for visit counts, but um, visits a little bit more complicated. And also adding visit types to, to help get us closer to this question of why patients travel for care. Um, so that's kind of what's in store next. And that kind of wraps it up for me. So are there any questions specifically about patient migration? And to clarify, that's directed towards Chair Mullen and the board. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is Susan Barrett. Does the executive director have a quick, can I have a quick question, Sarah? I guess, boss, it's up to you. <laughs> well, is it okay with you, Kevin? It's really quick. It's actually a clarifying question. Um, as you long know as it's how clarifying. It's clarifying. You know how the um, Gobey decision happened in 2015, I think. I mean, when you're looking at comparing like 2014 to 2019, do you think that is going to have an effect on that analysis? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I just. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's, it's a good flag. And we're going to make sure that we have um, that very important caveat in the published version. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Hi, folks. Um, this is Jessica Mendisbal. I'm a member of the data and analytics team. And um, I'm just going to go ahead and give a pretty brief walkthrough of an update to a visualization that we presented last year uh, related to the all pair model total cost of care. So Kate, uh, if you wanna go to the next slide. Okay, so we're on slide 29. This is just a snapshot. I'll do a walkthrough in just a second. Um, but I uh, just wanted to remind folks a few things that have sort of been mentioned throughout this presentation, but related to total cost of care, uh, this is a resident look and we're looking at um, costs by HSA um, broken down by payer over time. So starting with 2012 and going up to 2018. It is limited to those members that are in V-Cures. So uh, Susan just mentioned, um, we have lost uh, roughly 70,000 lives uh, with the GoBay decision. Mm -hmm. So um, we do have that, that note in here, but just to make mention of that. Um, and, the, and this data is tied to a primary payer type. So um, mm -hmm. for example, members that are dual eligible are only going to be counted once and we count them under Medicare. And um, 
just to reiterate that uh, total cost of care is a little misleading because it is only the sum of some care, uh, Sarah likes to say. Um, so Sarah mentioned this in the beginning, but the expenditure analysis is a more comprehensive look at statewide spending uh, for system-wide. So uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and share my screen so we can take a look. Um, Okay, um, let me just back here. Can folks see the screen? Um, when you come to the page, this is available on Tableau Public. So it's published uh, with a tag for Green Mountain Care Board. And um, if you wanted to, you could come right down here and link out to a more detailed explanation of the background and methodology for the data. The data is also available for download. So everything is public. The first dashboard, is a per member per month look. Um, it's, I think, pretty intuitive. It opens up to 2018, but you can use the slider bar up here to kind of tick back through. Um, you could start all the way from 2012 and sort of tick through over time to see how per member per month is changing, taking a little bit to load. Um, the map is also a filter, so you can click on um, the different HSAs and the chart to the right will adjust as you're moving through the map if you wanted to see how those numbers are changing. It's going to default to all payer, but if I wanted to just take a look at commercial, the map should adjust with those values. Medicaid as it's changing over time. So this is really a tool that's meant to be exploratory and let users come in here and just get a sense of how things are tracking. Um, I'll show you the, the member table. But I think, you know, um, we would love to hear feedback on what else folks might want to see um, in terms of additional data. We've spent some time um, talking about that internally. If anybody has any ideas, we're certainly open to it. Um, the, the base data set does have some um, information on uh, age group and gender. So if that's of interest, um, I think that that's something that we could certainly add in. So member table functions pretty similarly to, um, to the per member per month. And again, we can just kind of click through the different HSAs, see how um, that's tracking over time. We can see the dip in commercial in 2016 and, um, and we can also adjust by payer. So uh, it's pretty quick because it's been out there for a while, updated with 2018 data. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions or Sarah, if there's anything that you want to make mention of before we move on. Uh, not at this time. Thanks so much. And again, Chair Mullen, if you or the board has any questions for Jessica before we move on, we'll take those now. Yeah, unless they're clarifying questions on a particular slide, we're going to hold all our questions till the end, Sarah. Okay. Okay, great. Hi. I'm David Glavin, and I guess I'm next. So um, I was both shocked and honored to be selected as the anchor for our A Team Relay. Um, but I'm going to be discussing a few things related not just to a specific report, but also just uh, give me kind of, just to wrap things up, give a kind of a general overview of um, how we're starting to roll out these uh, interactive reports um, to provide the board and the public some easier insights and access to the data used and um, in describing aspects of the remote healthcare system. And I also wanna show you where they live and how, they act, how to access them. Um, so if I'm going to go ahead and share my or I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Actually, if you want to scroll ahead a slide, um, Kate, and then we'll come back to that in just a second here. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and start you guys off from a, um, our home web page here. So. Let's see. Make sure everybody can see this. So. Um, 
I'm going to discuss one of the one of the reports, uh, not in great detail. This is also a report that's been out for a while. It's the Vermont Hospital System Financial Report. But um, I first want to point out how all of these reports, um, both interactive and some of these are not interactive reports, but um, can be accessed through our data analysis and reporting page. Um, and on this page, we have this section down here called the public reports. And through that, um, you'll be able to access our Tableau Public website, or it will launch you into more detailed elements of each report. So for example, um, the report that uh, Jessica just got done showing you, if you click on that all payer total cost of care link, that brings us to this page that um, provides a link to the interactive report, which li lives um, on what's called Tableau Public, Tableau being our platform for developing the um, the interactive reports. And in addition to that, we also have the methodology and background and our, the data that's available for download. Um, and I just do want to point out, make it, um, make it very clear that I think it's important with all these reports that anybody utilizing anything from these reports should pay special attention to the methodology and background as they'll speak to the specific population and or limitations that the report, um, that the report analyze or that the um, that the analysis is being reported upon. Um, so, you know, I, I know a lot of this goes on in statistics today where people will just do a screen grab of a chart and throw it up there and wave it around and, and call that gospel. And I think it's it's important that that um, that folks using these reports um, do a little bit of due diligence and um, and pay attention to the information that's provided. Um, we're going to try to get a little bit more consistent with this. Currently, not all of our reports have um, have as detailed methodology and background as, as for example, this one does here that we've developed. Um, but we are um, we are working to uh, to bring this up to speed, bring these um, this web page up to speed. Um, so that said, I want to. I want to just point out another report that we recently updated, and this is the Vermont Hospital System Financial Report, um, sometimes called the um, the Hospital Budget Report that Lori Perry from our hospital finance team develops. And in conjunction with that, um, I've developed a interactive report or a tool that really highlights the high-level descriptive um, elements from Lori's report and provides users with some interactive capabilities um, and in, in terms of looking at, in, in this case here, like specific hospitals, this is a high, uh, uh, financial snapshot for each of the hospitals. Um, and I'm not gonna go into too much detail here. I wanna encourage people to go to the site and explore these, um, but just to give you a couple of highlights, the map on the, on the uh, left-hand side of the screen here can be used to select different hospitals. Uh, the interactive report will change the, the um, variables and or statistics that are being cited with the exception of these top two static tables. Um, and over here on the far right, you can toggle the NPR, the net patient revenue by year. Um, for, and this is specific to each one of the um, hospitals that are being highlighted. So we can move to Rutland or up to the UVMMC and that will provide users with a little bit of insight into um, basically some of the high level um, characteristics for the hospitals. Um, we've also created a couple of other views here. One of them is the hospital systems comparison. Um, this particular view provides a number of measures or metrics that are that the users is able to toggle. Um, you'll note, um, and oh, I should point out for specific hospital system. So each one of these toggles over here provides you access to our PPS hospital systems. And down here, the filter will provide you with who those hospitals are. Um, you'll notice that there are no values and that's because these um, these line charts can look, uh, can get pretty uh, filled up with data if, if I put the actual values in there. But if you wanted to specifically highlight um, highlight a hospital, just select the hospital here and then it'll bring up the actual um, dollar values. And it looks like I've got to do some formatting up here to add a dollar sign, so I'll get that updated. Um, and just like I said, yet another tool for both the public and the board to be able to use um, 
in assisting them to um, what I like to call data dense information. So there's a lot of information available to you on one view here, rather than filing through a large report with you know 25 pages and trying to look for um, like for back for example like I want to look at, I don't have a section com completely committed to UVM. And then all the information in 25 pages, you can look at UVM. And then I want to pop over to Gifford real quick. I can put, select Gifford and pop over to that. And it provides that data density for each one of those hospitals. Um, real quick, back to our last tab um, that I want to highlight is just this is the entire hospital um, system for Vermont um, aggregated into just a couple of views with the budget values, um, the actual budget values in this this filter over here allows you to update the line charts or the line plots on the right hand side of the screen. Let's see. Oh, one thing I did want to point out as well, too, I didn't mention this at the beginning. Um, there are there is some limitations in terms of the browser, and we, we try to highlight that um, on each one of our um, reports. Um, we are using what's called Tableau, and Tableau doesn't play very well with Microsoft Edge or Microsoft Explorer. So if you're experiencing difficulty, um, excuse me, when, when interacting with these visualizations, um, please use either Google Chrome, uh, Firefox, or Safari to launch these um, um, and view these through as um, for a variety of reasons. <laughs> Microsoft, uh, um, this product doesn't play well with uh, with Microsoft um, browser tools. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I did want to point out a couple of uh, a couple of other um, things, or wanted to highlight just a couple of other things here, real quick. Let me stop sharing my screen. I can figure out how to do that. And I just wanted to uh, make a mention of. of Few of the things that we're uh, in the process of doing. One of them is in the process of enhancing the current reports that are accessible on the Tableau website um, and also access to the data and the supporting documentation. So as, as I mentioned before, um, we're also trying to rebrand um, and have a more consistent formatting and color scheme amongst the reports just so that people know that when they go into these reports that they're looking at GMCB curated data and reports. Um, in addition to that, and actually, I think I am going to go back to a quick screen share here, um, if that's okay. I just realized I forgot one. So I do want to point out that on, our, that if we, if on the Tableau website, this is the Tableau public website, these are the four reports that we have. So any of those four reports can be accessed on our State of Vermont mm -hmm. Mountain Care Board website. So I did want to point that out. I was remiss in doing that um, just a second ago. Um, and then, whoops, finally, um, like I said, um, any feedback regarding these points, regarding these reports is, is really welcome. Um, we oftentimes can miss certain um, pieces that the public or that the board might want to see. And also enhancing the reports is something that we want to do to make them uh, more interactively or more usable. Um, I know one of the comments we've gotten back is, is that um, these reports don't necessarily transition well from tablet to or from desktop to tablet. Our current reports that are on the web um, are designed more for use on a desktop, but we are going to be um, making cop or um, making the reports uh, available in a tablet format as well so that people that want to use them on tablets um, can access them and, and the interactive and um, visualizations themselves will look a lot better on the tablet form. So we're in the process of having all of reports to be available in those dual formats. I don't think there is, um, I don't think that we're going to be exploring using them on phones just because um, I don't think they're particularly useful on that size of a screen. Um, and then one last thing I want to do is just, um, just really give a shout out to all of our developers within the A-team. Um, I know these reports can look very simplistic, but they are not easy builds. Um, they, a lot of the solutions require a lot of planning, logic and problem solving that's involved on the back end. And our team, you know, just building these in general. And I think as, as um, Lindsay pointed out, um, in, just in terms of just that quick view of the data, um, all the team members require a solid grasp of coding in a variety of languages, um, how data structure or how data is structured, and 
also a solid understanding of mathematics and statistics to make these things work. So, um, you know, I, I, I know they look kind of simple and I know they're fun to use, but there's a lot of hard work and, um, and um, thought that goes into developing these tools. And with that, I will send this back to whomever will wrap things up. <laughs> uh, we're at the point now of questions and discussions. So um, we'll start with the board members and Kevin, I think we're turning it over to you for that. Okay, um, I'll, I'll go in alphabetical order. Um, Member Holmes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so first I just wanna say fantastic and thank you so very much to the, the A-team. Um, Having been on the board now for six years, uh, I can tell you that the evolution of data analytics has been tremendous, and this is going to be really helpful. So thank you. Um, I'm looking forward to digging in even more. And David, I wanted to thank you for flagging the importance of um, having folks look at the methodology uh, and the background section, because I do think that there are limitations to any data set that you put together. And you know, folks could use the data in misleading ways if they don't understand the limitations or the biases or the, the, you know, the populations that it uh, represents. So that was really important, and I appreciated that. Um, one question was for Kate. Uh, I'm just wondering how many applications do we get for per year now for data use in the Data, data Governance Council? And uh, what, I can't remember, forgive me, where are we at with conversations around fees for out-of-state users of our data? So uh, the, for the first question, we um, get, uh, I would say a handful of data requests each year. Um, we um, now ask uh, anyone who's interested in the uh, hospital discharge data set public use file, to actually file a request, it's a very simple request, but we, um, we've we learned now how many people request that, which is quite a few, I and mean, I would say, um, you know, in the neighborhood of, you know, 30 or more um, each year. So they, they come in um, a couple of a month. And um, for the um, data use agreement applications for data release for the limited use um, non-public data set for um, VUDs, it's, uh, limited, you know, there's not that many. There's a couple. Uh, we actually are entertaining one right now. And then for V cures, um, it's, you know, it's a handful. I don't think it's that many more than um, uh, than I've seen. Like, I haven't seen it really grow all that much um, over the years. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, you know, a handful a year. In terms of fees, we have not pursued that. Um, it would require a fee bill. Um, change and um, we have talked about it as a data governance council uh, in sort of preparation for the possibility of that. Um, you know, how, what what structures would um, fit for Vermont because um, we have a lot of other states that we can look to in terms of how they structure their fees. And um, and so we've we've done some of that research and explored that a little bit. We have not moved forward with that at this time. Are we an anomal uh, anomaly by not charging fees relative to other states? Many do charge. I don't. I wouldn't say we're an anomaly because not every not everyone does. And I I think um, it it some largely depends on how their APCD um, their Alpera Claims Database um, has been set up in um, in different states and um, I, I think states newer to this space um, incorporate a, a fee structure in their legislation and then in the in the rulemaking and then you know in their operations so uh, we've you know had our claims data for you know for a lot longer than many other states and um, and so we're you know, we're contemplating that separately. I don't, we're not an anomaly, but I do think that um, that we have looked at, you know, five or six or more um, states, at least that have interesting fee structures that vary. Okay. Um, and if I could just 
tag on to that real quick. I just wanted to highlight um, that I think the people who indicate an interest in the claims database is quite a few, um, but people actually go as far as submitting an application are not very many. So to help bridge that gap and get data more usable, we're currently um, developing some file specifications that would be tailored for analytic use so that you don't have to be a claims analyst to use it today. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you. Uh, my second question was actually for Lindsay. Um, you referenced the um, getting some of the self-funded back with reference to VCure's sub claims submissions. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that post the GoBay decision, the fact that you had mentioned that some of it is coming back. Yeah, um, there are some efforts underway to engage uh, these self-insured groups. Um, I'm I'm not the most knowledgeable about that. There are some other members of our team who who know more about that. But um, we do see, uh, like the teachers union, for example, that switched over, so that adjusted some of the numbers. Um, and then also, yeah, just in general, we are trying to engage those other self-insured because it is voluntary now. Post Go Bay, so um, just trying to get them to want to contribute data for a good cause. Does anybody else on the team want to speak more about that? Um, I'll just say that we know the population changed. Um, the people for whom we have claims and VCures are different pre and post Go Bay, and so um, there's different ways we are working to address that, um, but none will be perfect. Thank you. That's it for me. Thank you. Um, Member Lunch. Thank you. Um, I had, uh, I noticed that Mort actually asked one of my questions in the chat box, which is why the team had excluded kids. So I'll just highlight that Lindsay answered that in the chat box. Can, um, can I just uh, say that for the purposes of the, the public meeting, it's much better to ask a question in public comment than to do it in the uh, chat, because I'm not sure how that gets recorded. Thank you, Kevin. Go ahead, Robin. Sure, um, but I'll just say that uh, um, because we don't know how it's recorded, I'll just mention that what Lindsay responded was that uh, because they were looking at people choosing to, to, to where they wanted to get care, it's a different type of choice when it's a child, obviously, because the parent will be choosing, not the child. Um, but I actually didn't have uh, any other questions. Um, I thought I'm so excited to dig in and look at this information in more depth and start to learn about some of the trends. Um, so thank you very much to the team. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Member Pelham. Uh, thank you. Um, and my applause as well to the A team for doing this. Um, you know, I just can't imagine untangling all the complexity of this and putting it in a way uh, in, into a database that you know people can use and trust. Um, that what they're seeing is um, is reflects reality, but also understanding the methodology that you know, profiles the risks. My one question is, um, I would think there would be a lot of people interested in knowing this um, and, and getting fam very familiar with this, um, but it's also something that hunt and pecking by yourself uh, could take a long time. And I'm, so I'm wondering if the A-team, you know, will maybe do some training sessions, uh, do it online, you know, getting legislative staff and members of the public and maybe reporters and lobbyists and others that, you know, would naturally kind of gravitate toward using this data, but but uh, help them over the threshold uh, with some kind of SimQuest-like training um, so that, that they know the ins and outs. Um, so that's my question, probably for Sarah. Yeah, hi, thank you for your question. So um, I think that's a really important point and uh, one I should have made more clear is that we look at these as kind of um, exploratory tools and we're, we're certainly happy to provide support in learning to use them. 
We also, you know, will have the data sets behind them available for people to peruse on their own. Um, but the, the next kind of step in this will be doing what I consider kind of more of a analytical white paper or brief. And um, what we, you know, would be happy to do is help tee that up with some um, guidance from interested parties about kind of the questions that we can be looking at. For instance, a, a robust examination of in and out migration um, would be something that I think would be really worthwhile putting together, which would be kind of figuring out a cogent way to compare or bring together the hospital discharge and VCARES data to get some estimates of what that looks like over time. So um, that's that's something we absolutely want to help provide. But, um, you know, I, I consider ourselves in the business of helping to answer questions more than posing them. So we um, definitely would like help figuring out the, the best way to address need. Thank you, Sarah. And member Yusufer. Uh, thanks. First, um, you know, uh, this presentation is very helpful, especially as we move into the hospital budget timing and, and being able to look at, um, you know, some of this HSAs and things like that. Um, I really don't have any questions. I went through with the team earlier the presentation, but just one comment on when you're looking at some of the total cost of care data. Um, and the percentages that show the change year over year, one thing um, you need to watch out for is as Medicare, people in the Medicare realm increase, and if it's offset by commercial or Medicaid, the percentage change in total and total cost of care can look much higher than the sum of the aggregate, if, if you know what I mean. So if each of them, if, if uh, if they all went up by 3% year over year, as far as change year over year for total cost of care, if the population shifts where more people go into Medicare, which is a much higher rate, then the percentage looks a lot higher. So it's just something we're gonna have to watch for as we go through some of the total cost of care information. But all this very helpful, so thank you. Okay, at this time we'll open it up to the public for public comment. Hi, Kevin. I have a, oh. Go ahead, Eric. Uh, this is Eric Schulteis from the HCA. So this question is about slide or comment is about slide 26 that Lindsay presented. I, I guess I was just a little confused by the average and median out of pocket spend. And um, so just a few thoughts about that. I, I wonder if the value of presenting that data is um, outweighed or is outweighed by potential misuse. So I think when I saw it, I both look at median and um, average. So it's like it's a highly skewed distribution, um, kind of like income, perhaps even more so. Um, you know, maybe put a pop up or something where you could click to look at that. But I think also there's a lot of variation between median inpatient, outpatient and ED spend. Mm -hmm. And there's some extent to which when I see this, it's like a question of is it per incidence? Is it per annum, per plan year? And yep. there's a sense that it there's a disconnect between, say, the 25 median out of pocket spend for commercial with what we're hearing from consumers, from what consumer advocates talk about nationally, and also a disconnect around the cost of medical care from policy think tanks, so like the Kaiser Foundation, Commonwealth, and United States of Care. So I think um, of all the things that uh, were presented, I think this one, for me, raised a lot of questions and kind of definitional issues that I felt like made it confusing. I, I just also wanted to echo what the board has said much more eloquently than I could, and also what David said, that it is an immense amount of highly technical and conceptual work that goes into creating these things. And, uh, you know, I, I think sometimes the simplicity of these dashboards um, covers up the amount of work that goes into it. And it's not easy to simplify this information in this way. 
and the A team should really be all of, including David and everyone should be applauded because it is a Herculean task to do. Thank you. Thank you for the comment, Eric. I think um, you brought up some really valid concerns and I can see where the language is lacking around exactly what is being shown in that table. Um, and also, the, uh, so we can fix that. That's really easy to fix. And also um, that table um, was probably the least popular anyway. So it's also really easy to take out um, and replace with something maybe more meaningful. And I, for one, would be really interested to connect with you in the HTA to learn what other metrics uh, might be useful for you all that we could build into the dashboard instead, in addition to adding more clarity. Um, so thank you for the thoughtful yeah. feedback. And absolutely circle back and, you know, at least with some folks down at um, the policy shops down at Penn or at the United States of Care, I can see if maybe we could talk about how we could measure impact on consumers, because it, it is a really challenging issue. And I would love to kind of circle around and brainstorm with you how we could do it. Great, thank you. Yep. Okay, other public comment or questions? Question. Go ahead, Dale. Um, she didn't mention how COVID was going to affect this. Does she have anything in terms of like 2020 data, data and going forward, um, how they're going to deal with the trends will look different. So just a broad question. How are you going to cope with that? Uh, hey, this is Sarah Lindbergh. I can take that one. So yeah, um, we absolutely are just starting to get in relevant 2020 claims. Uh, this fall is when we'll get our real first uh, robust look in, in VCures. That's when we'll start getting the relevant uh, months. But yeah, we it fully expect that uh, expenditures are going to go down in 2020. We have some early um, Medicare data that shows that it's down um, probably around the tune of 6% overall. Um, for the relevant months, I mean, for the year to date, I should say. So um, that's uh, a something that we're going to have to address. And, you know, I think depending on whether you are considering actuals and, and what it means or trying to forecast what it might mean in terms of utilization that didn't happen in its effects, um, the way you deal with that might be much different. So something we'll definitely be working with a lot of different stakeholders to present in a, a meaningful way, depending on the use. Could I ask a follow up question? Go ahead, Dale. And pursuing that same line of thought, and acknowledgement that utilization will be down. There are consequences to the fact that it is down in terms of how that happened. If it was ER visits because you can't actually get a doctor's appointment. Was it a telehealth that didn't really have the ability to deal with the issue as a telehealth issue, but was doing its best to do that. There's the limit on how many people can be seen a day. Um, there's the team uh, or coordinated team delivery system whereby you have coordination of your specialist and your provider, um, primary care provider. If that's fallen apart, because of COVID, are these things you're going to be able to capture? Because it's going to reflect somewhere that people had poor health. I mean, I can go on the international level and I can find worry about increases in certain diseases that they can no longer vaccinate for, and they're certain it's going to happen. And you're going to have other concerns about morbidity and so forth. And it is actually related to COVID. Is this hopefully making sense? Because I just kind of threw a lot at once. 
uh, I think I'm picking up what you're putting down, and uh, the, the I don't think there's an easy answer. There's going to be so many questions and probably not enough time to answer them all. So our first task will be kind of prioritizing questions and uh, working with the administration. I think that our first task will be trying to figure out um, where we still might have high risk but didn't have a lot of cases to help with capacity planning um, by using some historical influenza treatment trends. So I think that's where we're going to start. Um, and then from there, I think, yeah, uh, telemedicine is high on the list and we're working with other stakeholders who are examining that issue. Um, but yeah, in terms of the uh, impact on health, that's going to be a, a much more complex knot that probably will take a few years to figure out. Okay, thank you. Okay, other public comments? Um, hi, this is Susan Aronoff from the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. And um, I don't know where this fits in with data governance. However, just yesterday, um, just last week, when you were talking about the One Care budget, uh, both um, board member Pelham and myself commented about some missing data and information from prior years that we sort of surmised was probably out there and available and could be useful for understanding what's going on. And um, just yesterday, One Care published a, a press release announcing um, quality measure scores, which I uh, shared in the chat box. And um, when I went to the One Care website, because I would like to share this information, like either with my other staff members or council, where I'm a employee of a state council, an AHS affiliated council, um, or even share it with legislators, um, I saw this disclaimer that I shared in the chat box that says that the data is for the sole use of contracted One Care Vermont participants and must not be distributed to other individuals or entities who do not legally hold a binding contract with One Care Vermont. These materials are confidential and may only be used in connection with One Care Vermont activities. The use of these materials is subject to the provisions of the business associate agreement and or participation or collaboration agreement with One Care Vermont. So my question to you, Mr. Chair, is to help me understand this, especially in connection with this tremendous, and I should have started there, really tremendous presentation by your data team. However, I, I don't know what to, what to do now with this information. I'm wondering if so, cycling it through the Green Mountain Care Board could inoculate it so that you could make it public. We need to be able to so, talk about so this Susan, and we shouldn't have to wait till November to do so. Thank you. Susan, I believe that um, that disclaimer was a mistake. Um, I, I would have uh, said that we would strongly discourage the use of the, the uh, chat room, but you seem to have gotten a quick response. So Spencer Wepler, if you are online and able to address this, it's my understanding that you're removing that um, disclaimer and that it was put up in error. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. It's being removed this afternoon. Thank you. Susan, thank you are you are ever vigilant and you catch a lot of errors. So thank you. <laughs> Uh, I just try to do my job, Mr. Chair, and at a time like this, um, access to information in real time, it just really matters. And yep. um, I'm glad to know it's a mistake. There have been other times when one care stated things like certain Medicaid money can only go to them at Green Mountain Care Board meetings, and it's taken forever to have that be acknowledged as a mistake. So I'm really glad for the quick response this time. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for pointing that out. Uh, other public comment? Hey, Kevin, this is, this is Walter. Hey, Walter. I just kind of wanted to follow up on the Cleveland Mass a little bit. I just wanted to know what or how will all this mountain of data that has been so arduously collected sorted over, done, analyzed by your team, how will this help access to healthcare? 
which is our perennial problem. I did not quite catch the question. I'm sorry, because I want to. So I think what Walter was asking is how is all this data going to help access to care? Is that correct, Walter? Uh, yeah, precisely. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, I have my reception here can be spotty, but um, yeah. So again, I think that the, that would be a good example of um, probably a more robust kind of analysis, and that's something that will probably be better served by our health resources allocation plan, um, and we'll be have a whole set of analyses and reports associated with that plan, and access is going to be one major indicator there. Um, it's kind of easy to look at it from a geographic standpoint, but the true um, measure of access is a much more complicated thing to measure, and so that'll certainly be an iterative process, um, but in the meantime, this could give you an indication um, if it seems like uh, people are traveling more or are traveling less to receive care. That could be an indicator um, related to access um, changing. Um, one area where it will be interesting to see is for um, certain inpatient procedures, whether the ambulatory surgical center is changing um, some patterns of care up in that part of the state so that we won't start to see until we start getting uh, the next year claims in uh, and complete, but uh, I think that uh, measuring access well is, is a is a really uh, important thing to do, but a very uh, not an easy one. <laughs> okay, is there other public comment? Hearing none, I want to thank the A team. Um, as always, you're on uh, the right track, and uh, um, we really appreciate as board members um, getting better data, and, and uh, it seems like we're making true progress. So uh, thank you so much for all your efforts, and hopefully it will lead to better decisions made by the board. The next item on the agenda is hospital sustainability planning, and um, I'm going to turn the meeting over to um, Patrick, Elena, and Jeff. Um, I'm not sure who's taking the lead, but I'm sure one of you will tell me. Yes. Hi, Kevin. This is Elena. So I'll be presenting the slides today, but as, as you and Susan mentioned before, this is a, a cross-team collaboration. So um, I'm certainly not the only one um, responsible for this presentation. Um, so I will let me know when you can see the slides. See if we can. We're still seeing Kate, so maybe she'll have to. Okay, there we go. Okay. Got All it. right. Wonderful. Let me turn up. And Patrick and Jeff, chime in if I say anything um, that requires clarification. Um, so this is, uh, we're providing another update on hospital sustainability. As you know, we kind of rebooted this conversation um, a few weeks ago. At, you know, we, we put, put it on pause really as when COVID started because um, we recognized that stakeholder um, participation would be would be challenging when we were starting to try to figure out how to how this was all going to unfold um, but then kind of recognize you know with with a series of red flags that we have to get this conversation going again so um, we rebooted that we heard some public comment and and we're here again today to provide an update on what we've done with that um, since then so we'll revisit some um, of the background of how we got here um, uh, show you again an outline of the framework, um, provide some staff reflections on the public comment received to date, um, discuss proposed next steps, and then, you know, maybe if there's time permitting board discussion, potential vote, um, and then additional public comment. So we'll start with, you know, you know, why we're here today and a lot of the, the policy that runs through the board. Um, you know, Vermont is very expensive as a percentage of GDP. Vermont outpaces um, the national average in terms of spending on health care. So in 2008, Vermont was at 18.8 percent versus 16.9 at um, the national average. And this slide, I'm, you know, I'm sure you're you're accustomed to seeing at this point, but you know, it's no less shocking. Um, you know, since 2005, there have been 170 rural hospital closures nationally, uh, with with that rate only increasing leading up to COVID. 
Um, in 2019, uh, 25% of rural hospitals were predicted to be at medium to high risk of financial distress. And um, we acknowledged last time, you know, this recent study published in June that looked over the course of 2011 to 2017 showed that, you know, in that study period, those that closed um, in their final year before closure had a profit margin of, of negative 3.2%. Um, so, you know, all the red flags are here. And, you know, at a national level, Vermont is is no exception to this um, this troubling trend. Um, as you've seen, you know, our our operating margins have only been on the decline. Uh, where revenues um, are, you know, operating sorry operating expenses continue to grow when operating revenue um, is unable to keep pace. So, um, in terms of growth, so that's why the way you can see our margins um, on the decline. So, you know, COVID only exacerbated this situation and, and demonstrated, you know, the challenge of our fee-for-service system, which is, is disproportionately um, affecting rural hospitals. And rural hospitals are, are more vulnerable um, due to, you know, are more vulnerable to shifts in utilization and, um, you know, foregone revenues because of their thin margins, lower liquidity, lower occupancy rates, and higher reliance on elective procedures to cover their fixed costs. So this does not leave us with a lot of room for error. Um, you know, and the federal and state relief provided to date um, has been very helpful in addressing the cash flow needs of the hospitals. But we have to remember this is only one time money and is not going to solve this issue. Um, and, and there are, you know, pockets that still haven't been um, kind of made whole. You know, some have and some haven't, but, you know, this problem is not going away. Uh, so I think, you know, we have to keep our eye on the on the prize and and you know you know keep working towards value based care you know especially cuz you know at a federal level this is not going away but in the meantime we have to figure out how to evolve past fee for service system um and this brings me to this latest slide and um you know this is just a preview of, of what may be coming in the hospital budget process. You know, Patrick and, and the hospital team will go into much more detail and, and provide a much more robust explanation. But what you can see here is that over the last couple of years, you know, from 2017 to now, the, the change in charge requests have only increased. So this year, um, the submitted um, amounts you know, and we don't have all the data in. So again, this is an estimate and a subject to change was around 6.9%, you know, where in previous years we had around two and then increased to three, um, three percent and now it's 6.9%. That's quite staggering. So, you know, I like to use Jess's analogy of the balloon where, you know, we get squeezed on one side, it has to come from somewhere. So yeah, as you'll, as you're well aware, the change in charge is, is a way that um, hospitals or lever they have to really make their budgets whole. Um, and this is just not sustainable. It's not sustainable for the providers. It's not su sustainable for um, consumers. And, you know, we really have to figure out how we're going to solve this problem as a state. So I just wanted to revisit some statute that guides the work of the board and um, these various processes. So, you know, our five our five key criteria, um, you know, is to improve the health of the population, reduce the per capita rate of growth and expenditures, while ensuring access to care and quality of care. And I think this is where where we are right now. Enhance the patient healthcare professional experience of care, recruiting. Um, and retaining high quality health care and achieving administrative simplification. So um, I think these are all really important things to keep in mind, um, particularly access to care and quality of care, which is why I think we are um, talking about sustainability today. You know, it's not just financial stability, it's, it's making sure that Vermonters in each community have access to care and access to a high quality of care. Uh, so part of the board's duties are to review and establish hospital budgets, which you will be um, you know, back into the full swing very shortly. Uh, but through this hospital budget process, there's kind of two key pieces that relate to this work. One is around HRAP, which I think we will only find tighter connections as we move forward. But in HRAP, you know, it's the board shall um, 
identify Vermont's critical health needs, goods, services, and resources. Um, and that information should be considered in the hospital budget review. And then, you know, the board needs to look at hospital budgets that are established should promote efficient and economic opera operation of a hospital. So it needs to make financial sense. Hospitals need to, you know, work efficiently. Um, and then, you know, hospitals need to to kind of hold up there the bargain. So um, the, we can't do this by ourselves. We need to understand the budget, the financial information, you know, scope of services, volume of services, utilization information, uh, whether or not they're they're providing new hospital services or programs, um, depreciation schedules, and other information the board may require. So, you know, I'm not going to read this, but this, you know, there's a there's a whole host of information that the board should consider and can consider when establishing these budgets and understanding services this line um, is, is certainly a part of that. So, you know, I'll pause here. I think we've seen these goals and we've tried to make them more concise um, over the, the last uh, few times we've presented this framework, but I think we just want to make sure everyone understands, you know, this is, this is about engaging in a robust conversation. You know, the board can't do this work on its own, and, and, and I don't think the hospitals can do this on, on their own either. I think there are a lot of um, systemic um, challenges that we must highlight um, through having this conversation as well as, you know, hospital specific, but really the systemic, the systemic challenges. Um, and, and the goal of this conversation is really to ensure community access to essential services and, and identifying ways we can remove barriers to the sustainability of our healthcare system. Uh, I think it, you know, would be remiss to say that we, you know, wouldn't use this and thinking about what our all payer model 2.0 would look like. And I think we need to think about um, lessons learned, what's working for our providers, what's not working for our providers and um, sustainability needs to be at the center of that conversation, especially as we continue to move away from fee for service towards value-based care. How can we ensure that hospitals have sufficient resources to provide essential services? Um, number three, and I'm on slide 11. I'm sorry, I'm really bad at remembering what slides I'm on. Um, so slide 11, number three, we, we have to encourage hospital leadership boards um, and communities to work together to address these challenges. It's likely that this is already happening, um, but we just want to, you know, to make sure that, you know, if it's if it's not that that's something that we voice is, is important, that this is not just, um, you know, an exercise for the few. It's going to take all hands on deck. Um, and then identifying this process should allow us to identify both hospital led strategies to right size hospital operations um, in the face of many of these challenges, but also identify the external barriers to sustainability um, that need to be addressed by you know, other stakeholders. So the framework, um, I think today, you know, some of, and we'll go through the public comment and kind of where where we're suggesting we go next. But I think one one thing is that the framework we feel is is still the right framework. I think we can talk about the details and how we um, roll that out and implement it and what data we collect. But I think we need to kind of revisit um, and and remember kind of these core core buckets. So. You know, the financial health of the hospital, I think we still see the Green Mountain Care Board as providing hospitals with financial indicators, um, you know, along with state, regional, medians, benchmarks where relevant, um, to, and identifying those metrics for which hospitals at risk and ask hospitals to identify strategies to improve in performance. Um, you know, whether or not that's in their, in their control or not, but they need to help us understand what it will take to get them to a, to a better place. Um, you know, and I think this this first bucket, you know, we foresee doing all the data work and all of the analysis. And then this is just where the hospitals would provide commentary or their thoughts or strategies they already have in place. We would love to hear about those as well. Um, the second bucket is about, you know, ensuring provision of essential services. This stage will ask hospitals to assess the provision of essential services in their communities, identify service gaps, um, and develop plans to ensure the sustainable delivery of essential services as we move to a value-based world. So I think the key here is thinking about, you know, the value-based world and, and what we need to be successful when, when, you know, when we're talking about high quality and we're talking about population health. Um, 
the sustainability of other services. So this stage seeks to eliminate the efficiency and quality with which hospitals deliver other services. So beyond the, def the defined um, essential services, um, we're using the AHA definition. I think that that will still stick. Um, but how the delivery of these services supports the hospital's ability to operate in a value-based world. Um, so essentially, at this stage, we're asking hospitals to conduct service line optimization viewed through the lens of value-based payment, not fee-for-service. Um, and then strategic planning. So the purpose of the final stage um, is for hospitals to reflect on the analyses of the prior three stages and discuss their plans for sustainability in a value-based world. So it's really about drawing kind of across these three, um, three um, you know, insights, three categories, and, and looking forward. So public comment, um, we received one written public comment from the HCA. Uh, they recognize that this work is critical to ensuring Vermonters access to essential services, um, as well as the challenges to the proposed timeline. And the proposed timeline was the timeline proposed a few weeks ago. Um, a second public comment, which we received recently, and there was a lot in there, um, but you know, we just, for simplicity's sake, included the two key recommendations. Um, from VAS was to assess each organization's sustainability within the hospital budget process, which collects ample data um, already and is well designed to account for the factors um, of informing hospital health. Uh, they also ask that we rethink and postpone the broader conversation connecting sustainability with reform and transformation until after the annual hospital budget process is complete. Uh, this would offer space for more thorough and public dialogue about what the process should look like and achieve. Um, and then, you know, so we'll, I think we'll address that both of those through our um, our reflections in the next few slides, um, but we just wanted to recognize some other public comment we received, um, you know, verbally at the last meeting. Um, there were some comments about uh, conducting a system-wide capacity study um, before we start engaging in this work uh, to project demand for services. Um, and then, you know, I think there was recognition that this framework was very robust, very uh, detailed and represents an ideal, but hospitals may not be tracking information at this level of detail. So that was um, an important consideration. So, you know, just to kind of reflect on what we've heard, I think, you know, staff stand by the spirit and the timeliness of this framework. Um, we still think it's really important. You know, many of the red flags have, have been raised and, and we think we need to continue doing this work, but recognize um, and, and, you know, take seriously the comments that were made about how we actually move forward. Um, and, you know, we, we really, and the reason why we stand by this is really ensuring the provision of essential services in our communities as we move away for fee for service and toward value based care. You know, you know, there's the federal government is not moving away from value based care. Um, and if, if we don't prepare now, you know, we're not going to be in very good shape. Um, you know, and all Vermont hospitals should be in scope. Um, this is a question about a broader system and is not about one or two hospitals. It's really about all of our Vermont hospitals. Um, I think there was another question that um, had been circulated about how the board will use the details of this framework. So just so we're very clear, I think, you know, having this more nuanced information will allow the board to make better decisions as it relates to hospital budgets and determinations of NPR and change in commercial charges. If like, the board can understand um, the challenges hospitals are facing and where cross-subsidization of service lines is happening, you know, maybe there's a rationale for providing um, change in charges in one area that might not make sense in another, but without this information, it's it's hard to justify um, in such unsustainable increases, at least until we can find some more systemic um, answers to, to these challenges. Um, and then finally, the lessons learned through the details of this framework could, you know, could inform the development of a second proposal. We're not the only signatories on this model, but I think having more information will allow us um, to have those conversations and think critically about what's working or not working um, in our current uh, health reform effort. So. Uh, and then two final um, reflections, you know, I think we recognize the variation in hospital technology and resources, and we look forward to working with stakeholders to understand these constraints and the nuances of capacity planning and service optimization at each hospital. So, you know, we understand that not everyone has a cost accounting system. We understand that there are um, various allocation methods which make service line analysis challenging, but I think we need to understand that. And if hospitals aren't able to produce 
the level of detail that we're hoping to get out of this exercise that we have, um, you know, a robust conversation about a proxy or, or, or understanding how decisions are made on a local level. I think that's really the, the just at the end of the day. Um, and then, you know, I think we agree that a system-wide capacity study um, recognizing demographics and population dynamics is an important companion um, analysis. But, you know, I think we can't forget the work that we're already doing at the board, which is um, around HRAP, um, Health Resource Allocation Plan, understanding, you know, the resources on a community level. This isn't just a facility analysis. This is really about what's available to the community and where the gaps have in, might be. Um, and gaps and you know capacity might be, but um, I think you know if there if there is an opportunity to do a capacity study in a way that um, doesn't duplicate what we're already doing, I think that's something we're certainly um, looking into. So you know the proposed timeline we we took into consideration um, kind of the needs that that we have identified given how these data will be used um, as well as the feedback. Uh, from our stakeholders that the proposed timeline is is unrealistic. And I think we have to also recognize here, this is again, just still a proposed timeline that, you know, certainly with any COVID resurgence um, or any attention needs to be, you know, turned to the immediate needs of um, serving, you know, on the front line, that is, is the most important. Um, however, I, I think we need to recognize that we need to start working now if we're going to affect our FY 2022 hospital budget process, um, and that if we're going to have any insights about hospital, you know, sustainability in order to inform our all pair model 2.0 proposal development, our agreement requires that we submit a proposal to CMMI um, December of 2021. So that's really just around the corner. And I think starting this conversation now will allow us to have a robust stakeholder process throughout the course of the next year or so as we kind of um, start putting together more details of what that might look like. Um, so with all of those caveats, and just a reminder that phase one, the assessment of hospital financial health is really where GMCB will be doing most of the heavy lifting there, um, providing the the data, the analysis for hospitals to then provide commentary back. Um, and we're proposing around, you know, the end of December um, 2020. Um, phase two, ensuring the provision of essential services would, you know, we would be great if we could have that back sometime in March. Um, that way it could inform the hospital budget guidance. And those two pieces would, would be the main drivers of, of that guidance. Um, and then phase three, the sustainability of other services. Um, as well as, you know, what that would be in May along with aligned with the non-financial reporting or could be embedded within that, or um, we can talk about that in more detail. But uh, phase four would be planning, you know, for sustainability in a value-based world, bringing all that together, drawing these larger insights, and then having, you know, a, a more robust conversation about what, what that experience has been like for providers who have participated in healthcare reform. And that we would love... Um, to have that information back by, you know, by July of next year. So that would be in line with the hospital budget process for 2022. Um, in terms of our proposed next steps, um, so GMCB staff would continue examining the nexus between sustainability planning, um, as we've outlined these kind of four main um, stages and a trap in exploring the system-wide capacity study. So making sure that, you know, if we, you know, if we do kind of pursue a, a capacity study that A, it's asking the right questions about the community level and B, that it doesn't duplicate work that we're already doing. And then uh, GMCB staff to work with stakeholders to continue understanding the hospital specific reporting constraints. So as I mentioned before, I think, you know, we recognize that all, you know, all hospitals have different systems and there's varying levels of capability for um, tracking and reporting on certain information. So I think we need to understand that in a more detailed level. Um, and then, you know, continuing identifying and documenting opportunities for continuous improvement to support our proposal development for 2.0, um, along with our signatories. So again, you know, recognizing that we're not the only ones, but we are one of um, one of three, and that we have um, our duty to bring forward the best information we have to make that successful. 
So I think, you know, taking all of this together, um, the potential board vote today uh, could be to approve the outline of the framework. So those four stages, the adjusted timeline, which are all approximate and subject to, you know, anything that were to happen with COVID over the next few months. Um, but this would allow staff to fine tune feasible deliverables for each phase and begin any necessary data collection analysis. And, and we think about that, we, you know, we're, it's really about, um, you know, ATRAP and, and what we already kind of have access to. Um, and then I think there is a conversation that needs to be had about, you know, extending the framework to all hospitals. And, you know, I think, and, you know, from conversations with legal, the formal board vote um, might need to be postponed until the hospital budget process, um, as this was initiated in the hospital budget orders. But I think we could at least have that conversation today about the spirit of um, of the framework and extending that to all to all hospitals. I'll pause there. So this time I'll go with the board and start. A lot of echo there. I think someone's not on mute. Please mute yourself if you're not. Yeah, that might be helpful now. Um, I don't have any specific questions. Um, you know, I think this obviously is happening a little bit, little bit later than what we had hoped for, but because of what's going on with COVID and everything else, I mean, I think we have to have to delay the process. Um, I would just really, you know, reiterate that, um, you know, the goal is to have a sustainable system and that, you know, for, for my time on the board, what I've seen is, you know, many hospitals continuing to miss their top line, continuing to lose money and relying predominantly on commercial rate to try to make up the difference. And it still doesn't, uh, work because they're we have optimistic top line and and missing on the bottom line so i mean i think it's really important that we get to a place where we have a sustainable system and looking at um what's done at each hospital and then the quality metrics as well as um, financial will be important for it thank you for this somebody's still not on mute yeah somebody's still not muting themselves I'm gonna mute everyone, this is Abigail. Um, so if you are making a comment through your phone, just remember to hit star six. Yeah, it almost sounds like a radio or a television set in the background. Thank you, Abigail. Next, we're going to member Pelham. Thank you, Abigail. <laughs> um, I just have a couple of questions. Um, one is, uh, I mean, I feel caught between a rock and a hard place here because I, you know, don't have any direct experience, uh, you know, at a hospital, but I imagine it's pretty chaotic and, um, you know, hand to mouth in, in a sense. On the other hand, I feel the sustainability issue, um, especially as it rate, uh, relates to the cost shift and payer mix is vitally important. Um, pre COVID, um, you know, we had eight of 14 hospitals in the red in 20, at the end of 2018 at, at, in terms of operating margin, and seven of 14 at the end of 2019, with one hospital filing for bankruptcy. So to me, there is, this isn't an academic exercise, there's a real world going on out there. Um, and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, hospital margins are, are, are thin or non-existent. Um, and I, I use the statistic um, and because I think it's so powerful a point is that if you go back to slide five uh, really quickly. That one right there. If you add up all of those numbers uh, over the five years, they come to $329.2 million you know, uh, of, of margin um, over the five-year period. Of that $329.2 million, 295.8 of it went to one hospital. And that to me is uh, a, 
uh, an indication of the of the failure system wide of um, of fee for service and and so the transition from where we are in 2019 to where we want to be in terms of all pair model uh, 2.0 is something that is 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 going to be you know uh, take a lot of effort and uh, and a lot of co collaboration. And so my my question my first question is um, do you have uh, Elena in your mind you know how that transition might unfold specifically within this uh, sustainability effort to walk us away from fee for service and the kind of distribution of, of money that we see in this chart to um, a value based system where most of the money is being spent um, uh, through that those that mechanism. I, I think that's a, a good question, um, Tom. I, I don't think we have anything like that yet. I think, you know, we're working, like I said, we're one of, of three signatories, so we can't do this alone. I think the other missing pieces are our providers, right? I, you know, we have to engage in a robust stakeholder process if we're going to build a proposal that makes sense. But one thing we have heard is is capitation. You know, so I think if if we wanna if we wanna make sure that we can have a value-based system that allows providers to continue providing essential services and excel in a value-based world. We need we need to to decouple from volume, um, and so I think how we do that is is a question. What you know what should go into that uh, capitated payment is is to be determined. But I think that's where we have to focus our effort and figure out how we can stabilize this system. So I mean, but so you, the bottom line is, you think that we can get there within the next year and a half to two years? I think we can work with our stakeholders um, across the state agency and at the provider level to to think through that together. I don't think we can do it by ourselves, um, and I and ourselves being Green Mountain Care Board. Um, but I think we can come up with a proposal by 2021. Um, you know, I think we can can at least start that effort. And my only, only other question is looking at, um, I forget what slide it is. I think it's slide um, 12. <clears throat> and looking at, the, yes, this framework. So phase one was the financial health of hospitals. And so I'm trying to think near term next six months. Is there going to be a, a second wave in Vermont? Is there not going to be a second wave? We've got college kids coming back. We got K through 12 uh, opening up, um, but we've also done incredibly well. And every Vermonter, I think, should be proud of, of how well they've done, you know, during this. But it seems to me that most of the work in Phase One will be done by the Green Mountain Care Board staff. It's not. There isn't a lot of put, you know, um, uh, onto hospitals. Uh, between now and uh, December 20th. Um, and uh, and obviously, if there is a second wave in Vermont, um, all bets are off, I think, uh, in, in, a, in a lot of in a lot of places. But um, but w would you share that opinion that most of the heavy lifting in phase one is going to be done by the Green Mountain Care Board staff? Yes, I would. And I think, you know, um, yeah. Yes, I'll just leave it there. Yeah, I think we're, you know, as I mentioned, we will be doing all of that analysis. We will be compiling that data. And I think where we're asking for the hospital's participation is really to help us understand the barriers um, or why, you know, why they're in this certain level of risk. So providing additional, um, you know, color to that financial Thank analysis. Thank you, Elena. No problem. Okay, member lunch. Thank you. Um, the I wanted to just comment on the H HRAP connection because we did do an initial collection of data in HRAP from hospitals. Although um, the team who, which the the team of just man visible, um, the team of one or two, because um, I think we had another staff member help as well. Um, did, there were some holes in that data. So I do think it's important for for the teams to work closely together. So we're not doing multiple data requests, uh, but we do need to clean up the remaining HRAP data. And I do think they are well crosswalked. So 
I don't think that's a, a difficult task, but um, something that I think is really important and that would really be reflected of the second and third pieces of the framework, I would say. Um, I just wanted to make that comment about HRAP. Um, on the financial health, when I went back and looked at the financial health dashboard, it looked like a, a number of those indicators are things that we are already collecting in the hospital budget process. And so um, to the extent that the hospital is reacting to that information in their presentation in next month, or uh, actually this month, it's already August, isn't it? Um, I think we should be trying to pull that information as well out of those budget presentations and transcripts um, so that we're not asking them to respond again to something that they already talked about now. Um, but overall, I, I, those were really my couple of comments. Um, I do think, I do like that um, the timeline, I do think there needs to be some flexibility in the timeline to react to circumstances. I would note, though, that um, on, on trying to figure out how to ensure that this information and process is, we're learning from it for moving forward with APM 2.0, on top of the submission of a proposal and then the negotiation, there's also an 18 month Medicare implementation timeline. So to the extent um, that we think there are components of changes to the payment methodology, we need to keep that in mind. And so sooner the better in that sense, because it uh, the, the Medicare apparatus is not easy to move. And as we have already seen uh, with some of the new payment models, um, they do have operational hiccups along the way, which we should also expect. So I guess those were my top of mind comments. Yeah, thank you, Robin. No, those are very helpful. I think, um, you know, point, points one, two, and three, well taken. Um, you know, we will, we have intended to go back and do a deeper dive with ATRAP. Um, and then I think that's a great idea. You know, we can just you know, copy paste what we learned from the hospital budget process and kind of say, you know, has has anything changed? If not, you know, thank you. And then here are the remaining items to alleviate that administrative burden. But um, yes, on CMS, you know, the 18 month, especially if we're, you know, trying to do a capitated payment that we don't already have in place here, that might be, um, you know, that whole 18 month period. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Member Holmes. I think you're on mute, Jess. Jess, we didn't hear anything. Are you? We still can't hear you. Radio silence. <laughs> Can you call in, Jess? Can, can Abigail unmute her? Oh yeah, it's another. So Abigail sent me a text saying I can't unmute her. Can she'll she'll be trying to call back in, so let's just give it a minute. Can I just so chime that? in? I had one other thought while we were uh, sure that'd to be unmute. perfect. Robin, thank um, you. Can you hear me now? Oh, oh. Yep, we can. Yes. Okay, go Robin. That's fine. Go, okay, go, go. I was just going to say, um, I do, um, I do like uh, the, I, I mean, I think I've said this multiple times, so not to repeat myself over and over again, but just one more time at least. 
uh, I do like to me this this does need to be a practical um, exercise and not theoretical because it's not going to be helpful if it's theoretical. So uh, I think the data constraints and capacity constraints are important. And if that means that we have to get a higher level of data so that we still have information that's useful, um, that to me is more helpful than um, you know, trying to work at a more detailed level where we have vastly different information hospital by hospital. And not being able to compare it is going to be a challenge for us. Um, and how we look at it on a system-wide basis. So um, I, I, I just wanted to put that out there is that it, I think as staff is working with stakeholders to figure out what exactly makes sense, um, for me that it needs to be very practical in order to be useful. Thank you, Robin, very good points. Jessica. Thank you, Kevin. First, I was unmuting myself, but it didn't seem to be going through. So I hung up and called back in. Um, so I guess, you know, I don't have any questions. Uh, I want to thank Elena and others for working on this. Um, and I guess my point is, given the vulnerability of our hospital system right now, and given the current state of our economy, which may get worse in the next few months, and the fact that healthcare costs continue to outpace inflation, I feel as though it's, the time is of the essence to figure out how we're gonna make sure that Vermonters have access to high quality, low cost, essential services in their communities. And we need to make sure that our, our hospitals have pathways to financial sustainability in a value-based world, which we are moving towards uh, you know, at, at higher speeds. Um, and I think that the importance of having more information about what it takes to deliver essential services in each of our communities is paramount to our negotiations with the federal government for an all payer model 2.0 and thinking about rural sustainability as one of the goals of that uh, next negotiation. So we need more data and understanding of what it takes to deliver those essential services. So these sustainability plans are a first step in that direction. So I support the outline of the framework. I support the adjusted timeline. I support obviously the need to further adjust the timeline should there be a resurgence of COVID. Of course, we should do that. Um, but I, I believe that the outline of the framework is, is are the types of information that we need to make better decisions as a board to ensure that Vermonters have access to care that they need and to make sure that hospitals have the resources to deliver that care. And, you know, so I would um, be happy to make a motion that we uh, approve the outline of the framework and the adjusted timeline and delegate to staff working out some of the finer details about what the metrics might look like um, and so that they can begin the data collection analysis that will be required for phase one. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Did you have any other uh, points, Jess? Because I do want to open it up to public comment before we uh, vote on anything. That's fine, yep. No, I don't have any other comments. Does any other board member have any follow-up comments? Hearing none, I'm going to open it up to the public. Comment. Go ahead. I like what I'm seeing, but I, I just want to voice I have strong reservations around. I, I haven't seen, none of us have, what the hospitals are going to present. Although as a board, you're much closer to what that looks like than I am from where I'm sitting. Um, I like Jessica's point about you don't know what the economy is going to do. And that's on many different levels. Uh, you also don't know what the community response will be and what society will do going forward, how they will respond. Um, you don't even know how schools are going to respond yet which could be a huge contributing factor going forward as to 
what's going to happen within communities. Um, I just don't know if we're getting a real grasp of this. That's my concern. I'm wondering if this isn't going to run away from us. Um, I don't want to see it do that, but I think it's a valid concern. So that's my opinion um, at that point. Thank you, Dale. We appreciate that. I see that Jeff Tiemann has his hand raised. Jeff? Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I um, uh, appreciate the opportunity to comment in this conversation today. Um, I've obviously made comments several times on this issue before, both in writing and before this board um, in, in these meetings. We submitted a letter yesterday, obviously, that was featured in your presentation um, and that reflects the thinking of hospital leadership throughout Vermont. Um, that's why the letter included the signature of every hospital president or CEO. Um, including Dr. John Brumstead, who I'm not sure is able to join the hearing today, um, CEO of UVM Health Network, but ask that if he's not able, um, that I convey his support for the letter um, that we sent earlier. Um, as I mentioned many times, we support sustainability planning done in the right time um, and in the right way. Uh, what we don't support for the reasons that I think we've made terribly clear um, is a new regulatory framework that we view as onerous um, especially for hospitals um, already saddled with annual budgets and managing a pandemic. I did appreciate the comments made today by Elena and others on the sensitivity to the potential for another um, outbreak or, or COVID related development that causes us to need to take our attention away from these matters. But I would just point out that that almost implies we're not doing that now. Um, and that is, that is just not the case. Um, while we've been sitting on this call, um, I have received eight emails from chief medical officers about a testing issue. COVID issues are happening right now very much. Um, and just because we're one of the states that's a little more effective actually means that some of our work can be even more intense and more important to make sure we stay that way. Um, as we said in the letter, um, if sustainability is about health reform, and I think several different purposes and goals were mentioned today and in previous meetings, um, that, that really deserves a separate public dialogue um, that includes more stakeholders because whether we're informing the all-payer model or just looking at service optimization around the state, that needs to not just be a hospital conversation. That needs to be a provider community um, and government partner and community-based conversation as well. Um, you know, I think when the all-payer model was developed, one of the phrases was that it's provider-led um, and it's important to distinguish that from being led by um, a regulatory body. Um, and then finally, as Elena pointed out in this sort of statutory justification for this work, um, a stated goal of GMCB in the statute is to achieve administrative simplification in healthcare financing and delivery. Um, I think it's pretty clear that this kind of framework adds to administrative complexity and cost. Um, and therefore goes against GMCB's stated purpose in that sense. Um, I would also just point out from a sort of logistical standpoint that stage four under the revised timeline does appear to take place um, as hospitals would be preparing their, their following year's budget. So, so still a lot of activity that would be taking place at one time. Um, so with all of that and our letter in the record, um, I thank you for listening. Um, and please know that, that the hospital association and the hospitals we represent throughout the state um, are committed to getting through COVID, are committed to um, moving to a health system that works effectively for every Vermonter. Um, and with the right goals and the right timetable, I'm confident we can work together toward that goal. Thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Jeff. We look forward to working with you and your members to make sure this is done right. So thank you, as always. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I think that uh, Mort Wasserman has his hand up. Mort, did you have a question? Looks like he's muted still.
Well, it shows up as Hi Richard. There. Is that you, Mort? Yeah, it's not. It's not me. I bet it's some other Richard. You know, I go by Mort, no. Kevin. This is another Richard. That's uh, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> this is Richard Slusky. Oh, hi, Richard. <laughs> hi. How are you? How are you, Kevin? Um, so thank thank. I I've been listening to the conversation. It's great to to be part of uh, these uh, conversations again. Um, one, I did want to mention that I have, I did send public comment to the board. I think I put it under hospital budgets, but it, it I think also belongs under the sustainability question. So I hope you've received that and have we had did. an opportunity to look at it. Um, yeah. Okay. And also, I just uh, on that point, a question, can the public access these public comments that go to the board? Um, I couldn't find a way to look at, I assume there were other comments and I haven't been able to find a way to look at those. So if there is a way, I would hope that that could be accomplished. So I, I'm not sure if Christina is on the call, but if not, Abigail, could you um, provide Richard with a link to the public comments? So um, we don't always post public comments, um, and but if you would like them posted, Chair Mullen, we can do that. But yes, the, I, I all our records that. are, yeah. And just so everyone knows, like public record requests, you can always ask for public records through our website. You email um, gmcb.publicrecords. So if there's something not on our website that you think is um, public, we are required to give it to you through a process um, as long as it's not confidential material. Yeah, I think it would be nice if they could be available more easily than through a public request, public records. Request. Yeah, and I was just going to say anytime, this is Susan Barrett, anytime anyone would like to receive any information or is having a hard time finding something on our website, please reach out to, to me or Abigail. So but as much as possible, we'll try to air Richard on making sure they're posted. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you, Kevin. Um, the, I, my, the substance of what I wanted to say, I guess, today is that, um, I, I mean, I, I think, um, well, I, I mean, with all due respect, I think this discussion in some way seems to ignore the fact that we have entered into an agreement for an all-payer model with uh, Medicare. And the agreement calls for a phasing in over time uh, of moving, movement toward an all uh, value-based payment system. And I, I think until we make um, more progress moving more enrolled citizens into the ACO and into the all-payer model, we're not going to be moving sufficiently away from fee-for-service, which in my opinion is the root of many of the problems we're facing today. And I think was exacerbated um, by the COVID uh, experience. Um, when you have hospitals that aren't, are, are denied the opportunity to provide services other than emergency services, they are unable to generate revenue. And so, you know, I mean, that's just exacerbated the problems, the financial issues that the hospitals have been experiencing. So I think the, the faster we can move away from this fee-for-service model, I think the more opportunity we will have to address the issues that you've been talking about today in terms of the sustainability of the, of the uh, health, healthcare system. And, and the issues that I see in that regard are that, you know, we have, we have hospital employees who are self-insured, hospitals that are in self-insured plans. We have the school system. We have the state employees uh, who are continuing to be in self-insured plans, many of which are not enrolled in the ACO. And there's about 160,000 people, I think, that are in this self-insured um, bubble that, you know, I, I think need to be encouraged to take advantage of the opportunity to move to what we think is a more efficient 
and higher quality uh, healthcare system. So, and I think that falls to the Green, Green Mountain Care Board, to the hospitals, and to the administration to, to start to, you know, publicly encourage uh, the movement of these individuals or, or these businesses um, to move employees into uh, these systems. I also have a question about where the money is that the insurers collected in premiums that were not paid out to the hospitals um, and how that, that uh, money um, is that apparently was not paid in for services is being um, considered in the development of rates of the insurance rates for next year's uh, rate increases. I think the issue of the hospital sustainability um, and this, this plan uh, to do all this research could be, I think, more easily addressed once we move to a value-based payment system that's not dependent on fee-for-service. Um, and I think there are opportunities today, not waiting for another year to begin thinking about which services are not essential, which are low volume, high cost, that those could be incorporated into the budget discussion uh, as it uh, when it begins this August. So I, I think there are things that can happen now and that we shouldn't be waiting uh, for another year to start to think about how we're going to do this. By, the, by that time, we will not have met the goals of the all-payer model agreement. So I, I encourage the board, the hospitals, the insurers, the administration to really be sitting down together. And I think Jeff uh, Tiemann made this point. This isn't just a hospital issue. I think this is an issue uh, for our administration, the Green Man Care Board and others to really be sitting down together to figure out how are we going to meet the goals of the all-payer model in a timely fashion and what are the services that are essential for the hospitals to be offering uh, to ensure access, uh, efficiency, and high quality services. And I think a focus on cost management rather than revenue production is a, a, a shift in focus that ought to occur soon. So I'll stop there, but uh, those are some of the thoughts I've had in, uh, in watching uh, this, this whole process. Very well said, Richard, thank you. I see that Susan Aronoff has her hand up. Yeah, so this is just a reminder, Mr. Terror, and I don't know how you've divided the responsibilities between Green Mountain Care Board and Agency of Human Services, but as you work on the next iteration of the all-payer model, I hope you keep in mind that there's a statutory requirement that this time around, because you have to add the Medicaid funded long-term care services that have not yet been part of the financial service targets, because those have to be added, there was a statutory requirement added that your process in coming up with APM 2.0 has to include the stakeholders of those services who in the provider-led effort, as Mr. Slusky could well attest, uh, were not part of the discussions then. And um, hopefully we'll put, be part of the discussion going forward because to bring up the auditor's report, um, it hasn't yet been shown that the value, that there is a value in the all-payer model, that there's a return on the investment that exceeds the investment, that the Medicaid losses of over 17 million in 2019, pre-COVID, have to get a fair hearing. And it's your job, the Green Mountain Care Board's job, to assure that the costs and benefits outweigh, you know, that there is a return on investment. And if you ever come up with a way to assess that denominator in your last slideshow from last week of the administrative costs versus, you know, the value of the all-payer model, I hope you'll also take into account the areas where the quality has gone down, where access has gone down, where costs have gone up, where the uninsured rate is going up, where Medicare Advantage is going up, those are all populations that can never be in, will always be out. 
So this model that you're going in on, all in on, that so far only covers a third of all Vermonters, has shown itself to be expensive and ineffective. And yes, I am trying to track this as best I can. I'll take Spencer at his word that that was a mistake to shield that data. But there's reasons why this data is hard to find. And the A stands for accountability. So I hope we get there. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Other public comment? Can I, Kevin, this is Elena. I'd just like to, because it's been said a couple times, I just want to make clear that this is not to replace the all-payer model 2.0 stakeholder process, that this is just an opportunity. Just want to highlight another input to that process. So certainly, like I've mentioned before, we are not the only signatories on this model, that this would just be another opportunity to provide some input to that thinking. So Susan, I think your comments, you know, and, and Jeff and everyone else, yes, there will be a robust stakeholder process and um, we are working on getting that rolled out, um, which is why we need to also get this rolled out um, so that we can have all the best information as we move forward. Okay, other public comment? Mort Wasserman, can you hear me? I can, Mort. I saw your hand raised, but I wasn't sure if it was from the earlier. <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to keep track. So um, there were two very provocative public uh, comments on this issue of sustainability recently, one by Bill Schubart and one by the estimable Ham Davis, both in, uh, I read in Vermont Digger, that really called for either closing hospitals or demanding hospital affiliations. Some really terribly difficult conversations which are going on right now in this meeting. I hear them and, and all people are of goodwill. I guess my feeling is that the, you know, the Green Mountain Care Board isn't the only player here. It's one major player, but it has a lot in the way of carrots and sticks available to it, I believe. And the board members need to consider where they can best exercise the use of those carrots and sticks as we go forward in a decision making process that is bound to be painful and difficult. The other, the other point is that the other power you have because of your, the respect that people have for you, and yes, people do respect you, is in the area of moral suasion to work with those folks where your powers do not extend to partner and make things better. And I would love to see a more public discussion by the board. The, the board's website is a very passive entity. All websites are passive. I would think it would be good to see board members uh, or the board perhaps collectively speaking out more uh, and addressing things uh, on the need to go forward because we are in a crisis. And uh, the, epi the pandemic, the, car the, the COVID pandemic is an enormous opportunity and it, is, uh, it may get in the way of reform, but it actually reveals very clearly where healthcare reform needs to go. That's all. Thank you, Mort. Other public comment? Uh, it's Walter. Go ahead, Walter. I just wanted to echo the person's uh, who before me asking about where the insurance companies um, how their money has gone that they haven't paid out in all of this COVID stuff and why they're asking for a raise and to tie it in and wonder if the all payer model is really the way to go here with after this crisis and with hospitals all in the in this crisis mode. Because here we are trying to you know, we're not getting any raises and all of a sudden these the insurers want more. Yeah, I'm not going to comment, Walter, because we're in the, the middle of deliberations on rate review and 
Um, that question would have been better asked at the public comment period for the rate review process. But we hear you. <laughs> Kevin, can I get a comment? This is Ham. Go ahead, Ham. Um, I think that I think that I understand that the uh, that uh, Jessica Holmes' motion is on the floor. Um, I think the board ought to approve that. My view is I, I think the the idea that we're just scrambling ahead here that we're just way too precipitous or just moving too fast. I think it's just completely wrong. We started working on this problem officially in 1983. We've had the all payer model has been on the table since uh, 2013 in, in its most modern iteration. And I just think that it's the most obvious thing in this world is that you can we cannot do anything with this system until we get the kind of information that you that is required by the sustainability framework. You simply have to know whether the uh, these heavy end, these high end service areas in small hospitals um, make any sense either in volume, it, it, whether the volume is enough to maintain medical sharpness, okay? And then whether this, the unit costs make any sense. And in many cases, I'm sure they don't. But let's see the data. Let's see the data. If it's, and, and not even, the idea that we shouldn't even look I think is just a mistake. The second thing is that the whole idea that the that COVID has to stop everything, I, I think that's way overstated. The COVID load in the hospital system has been astonishingly low. Now, I don't mean that the money that they had to give up by closing down specialty services isn't a factor, but a lot of that money has been made up by the federal government and, and mostly the service levels are back to normal. Even UVM, which was ready to fill up uh, Patrick Jim had a tiny number. And so the, the reality is the, you were gonna have to get at this, you're gonna have to get at this issue. Um, and the question is, there's, there'll never be a shortage of reasons to not do it. It makes sense to me to just go right now. It's not, it's not impossible. And if, if we can't figure out the kind of question that whether, if we can't even figure out whether uh, on, in various, there's enough volume for quality. That's the most, that's the most basic quality uh, test. The quali quality systems are really primitive. They, they don't really mean much. We, all they do at this point is just fill in boxes. Um, but at the, at the cost level, if, we, if you can't even figure out whether what you're doing, what your product is and what, how much money you're getting for it doesn't make any sense at all, then you can't do anything. Thanks. Thank you, Ham, and, and I hate to come to the defense of the hospitals, but I don't think that the point that was trying to be made was that the, the hospitals were overrun with COVID patients. The point was the an incredible amount of work that went to make sure that the hospitals weren't overrun by COVID patients. The amount of work that where departments were torn apart because that's where negative pressure rooms were to create the capacity to treat COVID patients, the, the, the continuing struggle for testing, the continuing struggle for PPE, these are all things that hospitals are dealing with continuously. And I think that was the point that Jeff Tiemann was trying to make, not so much that um, hospitals have patients out in the hallways because of COVID, but um, your your points are very well taken. Thank you, Ham. Other Thank public you, Kevin. comments? Other public comment? I have one more. Go ahead. And listening to the comments that have been made, um, it feels like this comes back to that sustainability issue that was mentioned in rate review. Um, and, and I know the board can't comment on this. I'm just commenting that as a reference point, this started coming up then and I knew it would come up in hospitals. <coughs> I think there is a much larger discussion. And in fact, schools is coming up in schools, a private school versus a public school. How do you fund a public school? How do you keep it sustainable? Where do the funds come from? It comes from the community. 
I think there's a much larger conversation that's going to break at some point, or we're in trouble if it doesn't, which is to simply understand systemically that healthcare can't be funded the way in which it is funded, and it can't be funded solely by the state. The federal government itself and probably other stakeholders as well, I just don't have a complete list in my mind, need to wrap themselves <coughs> around the fact that what COVID is bringing out is healthcare is more of a fundamental public good ingrained in every part of our lives, from our schools to the stores we walk into, and we need to own it and fund it because it is not solvent as it now is on any level. That is a conversation that, I don't know, it feels at times like it's 30 years in the future, but the crisis is now, is now. And I'm kind of hoping COVID pushes us over the edge as far as the realization of the real problem we have and what the solutions are. I'm also worried about the cost and lives to get there. That's it. Thank you, Dale. Other public comment? If not, I'll bring us back to the motion that's before us, which um, is to approve the framework as laid out in the presentation to delegate to staff to uh, move forward with the sustainability process. Um, is there further discussion from the board? I, I would like to. I would like to add just some reference in in this vote. Um, you know that uh, uh, we recognize that uh, it's an unknown road ahead relative to COVID, and um, that uh, this effort uh, needs to keep a um, a reasonable eye on any extra burden that that uh, that might come along with it with a second wave. I, I'm I'm sure that's understood, but it, it just you know, I you know, it, I think it helps to be explicit about it that this isn't, you know, we're just not going to keep charging forward when you know hell is breaking out, you know, in, in terms of a second wave. Other other comment from board members. Is Mike Barber on the line? I am. Mike, uh, um, do we need to have a roll call on this or I can't predict what the outcome will be, so I don't know it's unanimous. So you tell yep. me. Yeah, let's do it that way. Uh, so. Member Lunge. Yes. Member Holmes. Yes. Member Yusufer. Yes. Member Pelham. Yes. Mr. Chair. Yes. Thank you for that roll call, Mike. Um, and thank you, uh, Elena, Patrick, Jeff, um, for the uh, hard work that's gone into this so far. And um, I look forward to working with um, the hospitals to make sure that this process is done right and that nobody's time is wasted in this process. And we're also not uh, overworking the hospital. So um, we'll walk that fine line. And I'm sure that um, if we cross that line that we'll hear very loudly from people very quickly. Um, with that, is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? 
So, so moved. moved. Second. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone else? Anyone opposed? <laughs> Hearing none, um, have a great day, everybody, and uh, we'll keep plugging away. Thank you.